Hello, and welcome to another edition of the Latchkey Kid Movie Reviews podcast show, uh, whatever it happens to be, whatever it ends up being, basically a way to uh, just uh, get my thoughts out about some uh, films that I watched as a little kid and how I've kind of, um, how they, the films, and me, and society has uh, matured since the films came out. And um, we phrase it under the uh, latchkey kid. You know, it's, it's, it, it's put out that way because... Um, Latchkey kids, Generation X, uh, people my age were essentially kind of, sort of, raised by television and by media. We were the first generation to sort of be exposed to uh, the uh, a massive amount of media, but also um, a very... Uh, streamlined and compartmentalized uh, amount of media like we got a lot of it in but we only had a few different ways in which to view it but still way more than our parents had before us so we had um, cable TV uh, and HBO and Cinemax and Showtime and the movie channel and all that stuff and they would sort of Play over and over again certain movies and then we had VCRs which had hit the market right around you know 1980 and whatnot and they would uh, we could play V we could go to the video store um, which was a booming business for a little while uh, Netflix is the result of it now uh, is its descendant but Back in the day, it used to be uh, anybody who had, <laughs> in, a mom and pop could go in there and just open up a video store. And they were, and they were in like um, strip malls and whatnot in Pensacola on the west side or, on, or out on the key and stuff like that. And uh, anybody, you would go to the video store, you could just rent movies and then you could rent them continuously. If you liked the film, you could rent it over and over and over again. Um, or you could tape the movie if you had a VCR at your house. This is all new. This is nothing that a generation before us had ever experienced. So we were, we had like, uh, like if, let's say somebody liked uh, Dr. Strangelove. Like let's say our parents really liked Dr. Strangelove. They would go to the film, the movies and see it. And then it would leave the movies. And then that's basically the last time they saw it. They basically saw that movie once. You know, Gone with the Wind maybe every now and then would play on TV or whatever. The Wizard of Oz would play on TV or whatever. But you didn't... Ours was the first generation that got to repeatedly and over and over again, not entirely always by their choice even, watch films again and again and again and again. And the way we did this was through VCRs um, or taping... VCRs and cable. Those were the two. That's how we were sort of horse fed uh, these movies like in episode one, uh, Weird Science, uh, in episode two, Ferris Bueller. And um, in this episode, we're doing 16 Candles because we're, we're kind of rounding out John Hughes because he was the um, one filmmaker that I and many people of my generation kind of he was the first one that we were exposed to you know the body of his work and I, I wanted to start it off with uh, three of his films because he was you know you know for better or for worse pretty important to a lot of um, kids my age back then and adults my age now um, he kind of told us how it was to be a kid so I mean, and, and as latchkey kids, I know my mama gave me a hard time about saying it uh, after the first episode about calling myself a latchkey kid because she sort of felt like she um, didn't do it, like 
by, by my being that she didn't do a good job uh, raising me and, and whatnot. And um, it's the complete opposite of you know what I was hoping to uh, project with it is, is uh, like you know our my parents generation was the first one where both the parents had to go off and work like one income wasn't fucking doing it anymore um you needed the mama and the daddy to work and if the kid came home from school at 2 30 and the parents didn't get off until five well then there's a you know two and a half hour gap there so that's where the latch key came in they said just let your in, let yourself in and you know sort of occupy your time until we get home from work around five and uh, many of us occupied our time with john hughes movies or with hbo or by putting a tape into the vcr and watching this stuff and taking part in our in a, in a culture that was um growing and becoming uh a, the, the, the media side of our, and by media I mean like film and television and music and such, um, was growing vastly. It was, a, it was an exponential amount of growth uh, at that time. Like now kids, you know, fuck off on their phones and everything and, and socially, uh, social media is growing. But at that time it was, it was the arts that was growing. It was movies and film and television shows script and writing and comic books and such uh the 80s and 90s were a huge huge boom for for that industry and we latchkey kids fueled it mostly and uh now i'm trying to go back and look at it and say like what now that i'm you know with 30 years 30 years out let's let's look at it let's examine it let's see what it what Let's see what the films are like based on their merit as a film. Uh, let's see what the films are like based on how they contributed, you know, to our society. And then let also I'd like to, you know, kind of be a little bit self-important and say, what did the film mean to me? And this week's film, uh, the first week, this week's film, I, I do these like every six weeks. So this episode... Um, we did Weird Science in the first episode, the um, involuntary celibacy of Gary and Wyatt in the first episode. We did the narcissism of Ferris and Ferris Bueller's Day Off in the second episode. And in this episode, we're doing 16 Candles and we're doing the insecurity of Samantha in 16 Candles. And we're going to talk about a couple other things too, because... The movie is, none of John Hughes' movies are okay. Like, they told us how to be kids. I learned how to be, you know, what cool kids were and what being an adolescent, you know, was sort of like through John Hughes. And it's undeniable. Um, but he was not okay. <laughs> These films, they're, they're, there's fucked up shit in them. And, I'm, and in, in this episode, I'm going to talk about uh, some ways in which uh, this is uh, 16 Candles is the worst offender. You know, he's he's a little bit off in all of them, a little incorrect in all of them, but 16 Candles is the worst. And uh, we're going to talk about it. Um, we're going to talk about, you know, in every film, there's a, a star is born. There's somebody whose star kind of shines a little bit brighter than the others. We're going to talk about 80s mobiles, which is the cars that we drove back in the day. You know, you know Volkswagen, your Volkswagen Rabbits and your Honda CRXs and stuff like that. So anytime there's one of those in the film or, you know, a notable car, uh, we're going to mention it. And um, let's just get started into it then, shall we? Uh, the, it opens a little bit like... Ferris Bueller's Day Off in that there's a radio and they're sort of telling you what's going on in the town. They kind of set the scene by saying, you know, what's going on in the city around them. And it's basically a bad traffic day. Um, you, you don't want to commute in Chicago. I think all of, 
a lot of Hughes films take place in Illinois. You know, he's like Stephen King in that way. I'm sure if, you know, I was a big writer or, or director or whatever, I'd set everything in New Orleans or on the Gulf Coast or, or whatnot. But things are in Chicago here. And uh, it opens with a, you know, a guy delivering papers and, a, you know, a radio describing the, the traffic that goes on. So, um, you know, it kind of dates the film because now, you know, you use your computer for all that. But back in the day, you used the radio for it. And uh, media was much smaller, but it was way larger than it was in our, you know, in the generation before us. We come into Sam's house, and she's kind of got, like, Hughes directed Home Alone also. And she's got, like, a uh, Home Alone type family where it's big. They got a big house. There's kids fucking running around everywhere. There's chaos in the morning, and everyone's just kind of struggling to survive. And that's where... You know our our hero you know the one of the protagonists the, the main protagonist even though she kind of disappears in the second act of the story uh she comes out it's her 16th birthday hence you know 16 candles and the major plot point from the get-go is that her family uh has not remembered that it's her birthday her older sister who's sort of shallow and self-absorbed is um getting married the next day. I don't know why when they made the date for the sister's wedding, nobody thought, hey, it's somebody should, it should have been mentioned that um, it was the day after Samantha's birthday, but whatever. That's how insignificant Samantha is. And that's why Samantha is insecure. That's why Samantha has low self-esteem, which is going to be... <clears throat> Sort of her her driving influence throughout the rest of the film, but we zoom into her family. We get a quick little go through of what her family's like. Her little brother Mike is a dick. Uh, he's kind of like that from Weird Science, but he's a little brother. So a, a, a an asshole brother can be older or younger; it doesn't matter. He'll still do damage. Um, Samantha is sitting in front of a mirror and she's looking at her body, her now 16 year old body, her one day over into 16 years old body. And she's looking at it and feeling as though she's not a woman. And she describes herself as hopeless and forgettable. And the whole scene leads us kind of into John Hughes's offensive. This is Lance's list. John Hughes is offensive number one. He sexualizes children. It's throughout the whole movie. Uh, it will occur again and again. He sexualizes children throughout the whole thing. And I know children do this. And it's kind of a realistic, you know, interpretation of what kids are like. I don't think he could get away with it today. Because uh, he, he was a grown-ass man sexualizing children or um, that being what it is, uh, Samantha goes downstairs. She's greeted by everyone. Nobody wishes her a happy birthday. Uh, everyone's for forgot. Her mom kind of dismisses her and sends her off to school. Um, and her mom has wonderfully feathered hair. Uh, which, it being the 80s and whatnot, feathered hair was the shit. But her mom, has it's on point, her feathered hair. So Sam's insecurity is obviously exacerbated by the fact that her family has forgotten her birthday. You know, Sam's kind of like the girl that isn't there. You know, she's a, everybody's a little bit more important than Sam and she's failing it. So after she gets sent off to school by her mama, we have a little bit of a, some credits, some credits roll. And it's kind of like a series of shots, and there's lots of 80s style. It's pretty cool. There's jeans and shoes, and you know, um, the uh, Converse All Stars. There's some little one inch pins, which are awesome. Everybody loves one inch pins. Still cool today, if you ask me. You know, Pat Benatar and shit like that on them. Awesome, you know, real great stuff. 
It's not, you know, Sixteen Candles is not a super stylized film. You know, it's you know more character based and uh, script based and um, not a whole lot of uh, a lot of the people wearing plain stuff. I mean, it's the Midwest in the '80s, so eh, you're not going to have a lot of style. Even though, I mean, it is still the '80s. There is still some style. Um, then we cut to Sam and her friend Randy, uh, who's sort of hot, if you ask me. Hotter than Sam. Hate to say it. Hotter than Sam. And they show uh, a little uh, clip of her locker, and she's got, like, shit hung in it. Now, I thought that was pretty realistic, because I remember in the sixth grade at Warrington Middle School, when I got my locker, my locker was the first space that was my own that was not in my house. It was like an apartment, basically. To a little sixth grade Lance, that was a fucking apartment. So I was like, here's how I'm going to decorate it. I'm going to hang stuff from the fucking ceiling. Here's, I need to clean it every now and then. It was like a little kind of fucking training for me to, you know, maintain my own fucking space and shit. And it was fucking great. I loved it. I hung little, you know, posters of, you know, I don't know, fucking Bob Marley or whoever I was into at that time. But I, I knew it was my space. I had a fucking lock on it. No one could get in it unless, you know, I gave my permission or they had, you know, an extra step, bolt cutters or whatever. So I thought that was a pretty legit that, you know, they showed the inside of that locker as being Randy, her friend, Samantha's friend's own little personal space that she had decorated. I'm sure kids do that to this day. I don't think that's a generational thing. But still, you know, your locker as a kid, that's your first little public space. That's your own. That's pretty cool. Um, so Sam's writing in a little chat book or, or something similar. So that's a pretty... Uh, uh, something notable because before there was all this communication like fucking um, social media and Facebook and so on and so forth, we still kind of had these, you know, Latchkey Kids, Generation X, we still kind of had uh, the beginnings of these things. Um, you know, we would hang on the telephone and talk to each other all night long. We would have a little list of... Uh, of our friends' telephone numbers and whatnot, and we would pass notes and and stuff, and then we had these things called chat books, where which were there was a question at the top, there was one book, and it circulated around, and there was a, a, at the top of each page there was a question, and each person anonymously would uh, answer the question, the que and the questions were you know risque and stuff. The the better chat books, in my opinion. Uh, the questions were more risque and a little bit more, um, you know, I don't want to say intrusive, but, you know, they, they were deeper questions or, what, or you know, or, or a little bit raunchier, but they were funner questions. They, you know, they got through the looking glass and whatnot about uh, what was going on, like, who would you fuck, who do you think is, you know, hot, uh, have you ever fucked or whatnot. Stuff like that and Samantha gets one and she's uh, passing it to her friend Randy she gets one in class and she says who would you want to and it says at the top who would you want to fuck and she says Jake Ryan so enter Jake Ryan Jake Ryan is a popular kid at high school he's a Matt Dillon clone I don't know if John Hughes wanted Matt Dillon for the role or couldn't afford Matt Dillon but Jake Ryan is a Matt Dillon clone uh, in the film. And uh, he is in class with Samantha as she is uh, handing this chat book off to her friend. And he intercepts the chat book. And he finds out that this sort of underdeveloped, we'll, we'll call it what it is. I mean, Samantha said it herself, underdeveloped sophomore wants to fuck him. Uh, and he is a, you know, popular, masculine, mature senior. Hey, 
this is John Hughes saying this. If I'm making you uncomfortable <laughs> with the way I'm talking about this, this is the plot of the film that we have all seen. Samantha, underdeveloped, one day into being 16, wants to fuck a senior and whatnot. And the senior, come to find out, as we find out in the next scene, he's down with it. He's like, yo, this sophomore wants to fuck me, right? So the next scene goes over. I know, this is fucked up, y'all. Sixteen Candles is a fucked up movie. The next scene is he's working out with one of his partners, and he's asking his partner if he knows who Samantha is. And his partner is the voice of fucking reason. He's like, yo, she's an underdeveloped child. You need to lay the fuck off it. It's, you know, he doesn't say it, but, you know, it's suggested that it's molesty, right? And, um, you know, whatever, Jake, Jake's still not like, whatever, I'm, I might, I'm going to give it a shot, you know, because, you know, they say <laughs> there's a phrase out there that's, um, I mean, We've all heard the phrase, well, maybe we all haven't heard the phrase, but eager beats pretty is a thing. It's a thing amongst men, and it means, eager beats pretty means that, like, hey, if there's a woman out there on your radar, and she is more willing to have sex than a woman who's on your radar who is better looking and more sexually desirable, but also seems to be a little bit harder to get, then generally, or if you if you subscribe to the Eager Beats Pretty philosophy, you're gonna shoot for that, the one that's easier. Cause you can then just, you know, you don't have to spend so much energy and time trying to get them into bed. Cause they've already told you that like, hey, or they've already communicated, or you already know that like, hey, they, they're hot to trot and you can spend more time like actually fucking than, you know, the menagerie around trying to get them to go home and, you know, fuck you and stuff like that. So that's probably what Jake is thinking. Like, hey, she's a sophomore. Hey, she's underdeveloped. Maybe he's pedophilish. I don't fucking know. But he, he's down. He's down with Samantha um, for whatever reason. I can't think of too many reasons why a popular masculine uh, senior would be into a uh, sophomore who just turned who just turned 16 particularly because Jake's girlfriend is also a senior and uh, is uh, super hot but more on her later um, also during the scene where Jake's talking with his boy John Hughes is a defensive number two. Um, his boy calls Samantha retarded, which we all know you're not supposed to fucking say anymore. Uh, mentally disabled or, you know, whatever the nomenclature is now. Uh, but there are word is used a lot in John Hughes movies. But whatever, he didn't know, I guess. But also, you know, he could have, he could have maybe thought about it. Um, so. Speaking of Jake's girlfriend, we cut to the next scene where, I, and this never, in my high school, I never got naked and took a shower. I don't know why in, I never understood, maybe it was the South or whatever, but I never understood why in films when I was growing up, I saw like kids like naked in the shower and stuff like that. Cause I was like, I ain't ever taking my clothes off at Warrington Middle School or at Escambia High School. I ain't ever fucking doing it. Like, even when I was, like, dressing out for a gym, I was only in my underwear for, like, two seconds, and I hurried. Like, when my drawers came down and I was putting my shorts on, I, like, I would, whoop, jump out of it and then jump into my shorts and get out of it because I didn't want to fucking be around. I didn't want all the motherfucking public school boys seeing, you know, uh-uh. So... But in the movies, they were naked all the time. I think it was just a way for the, you know, pedophiles in Hollywood. Oh! Quana! 
Tijuana, the pedophiles in Hollywood that make kids take off their clothes. I said it. Um, anyway, Samantha and Randy in the next scene are just staring at uh, a very special character, an underrated character in the film, Jake's girlfriend, Carolyn, um, in the shower. So Carolyn's butt-ass naked, and Samantha and Randy are just staring at her and uh, super jealous of her body, which is hot. Um, I'm hoping the actress was over 18. I'm sure she was. She's still portraying, you know, a 17-year-old maybe or uh, maybe some seniors were 18, but still they're in high school. It's kind of fucking weird. Anyways, she is super hot. Um, Samantha and Randy are not wrong. Um, pretty, pretty amazing scene. And, of course, you know, John Hughes films it like, you know, there's glistening water coming off her and she's kind of, you know, just caressing herself, but. There's no denying she's hot. Uh, but that's a little weird. Girls staring at other girls and coveting their body. Not coveting their body like they want to touch it. But coveting it their body that they want it. I don't know. You ladies can tell me if y'all did that. I'm sure you did. I'm sure it's accurate. So, Samantha does her whole school day. Uh, there's a dance later on that night and such. And then she's coming home and she's on the bus. Now, the bus <laughs> uh, was where all the freaks and geeks went. Like, if you didn't have a car or you didn't have access to somebody with a car, then you, or your parents wouldn't bring you to school, then you were on the bus. And the bus was the dregs. I didn't want it. We called it the cheese when I grew up. And I live way the fuck out on Pretty Hill Key. So my bus ride was long. And I was often the only person on the bus. Or the, the first person picked up and the last person dropped off. And that, you know, you you were like low on the totem pole if you were on the bus. And so he's give huge points for accuracy for, you know, this depiction of all the nerds and geeks being on the bus and Samantha being stuck there with him because, you know, that kind of adds to her insecurity. We already know she's insecure, but she's got to ride the bus and whatnot. There's some people like listening to Walkmans and that's accurate too because I would listen to my Walkman on the bus just to kind of zone out and forget about how, you know, how low on the totem pole I was, you know, when, when I was, when I was, I wasn't always a bus rider. You know, I, I got out of it around my sophomore year. I finally hooked up with a senior or whatever and said, hey man, can you come pick me up? Tisha Robinson, whatnot. If you're out there watching this, Tisha Robinson, thank you very much. Uh, sorry about that gas money. Um, I think she, you know, a little sidebar on a beef here. Tisha Robinson tried to get me to pay her gas money and I lived like three blocks down from her. Like she was picking, like if she was driving to school, whether I, she was picking me up or not, she was spending the same amount of gas money. Like she, I wasn't spending, I wasn't causing, you know, incurring any cost to her. She was, I, all I was was just taking up a little occupant in the car. And whether she went there alone or picked up three other people or whatever, she wasn't spending any extra gas on me. But she still had the nerve to demand gas money, and then, uh, yeah, I had to pay her. She was making money off of me. I think she's a private businesswoman now also, so whatever. Props to her, I guess. But um, So, while she's on the bus, Samantha, we meet Anthony Michael Hall, who... They call him Farmer Ted. They call him the geek, but he is the breakthrough performance, you know, in, in this film. A star is born. He is our star is born for this episode because he does a great fucking job and um, just, you know, owns every scene he's in. He and Ken, he's got a crush on Samantha, not because she's eager. He might think she's pretty. Um, but also because he's a freshman and she's a sophomore. So 
he's sort of a social climber. We're going to get into a little bit later how um, Farmer Ted and Jay Ryan, um, Samantha's two, you know, part of the love triangle that forms throughout this film, how both Jay Ryan and Farmer Ted are garbage human beings. Like, they are fucking horrible people, and they completely suck. Uh, not to say that Anthony Michael Hall, though, did a bad job acting as Farmer Ted, because he did do a good fucking job. Um, he comes on real strong to Samantha on the bus, invades her personal space, touches her. Um, he just is awkward and kind of gross and stuff. And uh, next to him on the bus, uh, next to the little scene where he's fucking with Samantha is actress Joan Cusack, um, who wears headgear and she's uh, so it makes a little I don't want to say cameo because she wasn't popular then, but uh, she goes on to greater things in her life as does her brother, who is in the film a little bit later. So there's. Back in the day, and I don't see kids that do this anymore, so I don't know if they still do it or not. Somebody help me out with this. But back in the day, there were certain like types of braces in which, like, you'd see them in the halls and in school, and they like they would have all kinds of like fucking android like fucking shit like attached to their face and whatnot. And it was just like, Jesus, what's the How bad could your fucking teeth be when she got to wear a fucking halo and all kinds of crazy shit like that? Uh, anyways, Joan Cusack has some of that <laughs> as it's, uh, and they show it. And I, I think that's maybe a little uh, sign of the times. I think maybe, uh, what do they call it? Uh, orthodontics or, or whatnot, whatever, you know, straightening of teeth is called. That's had to have, there had to have been advancements in there. Since then, kids don't gotta wear headgear anymore, do they? Uh, somebody holler back at me on that. Um, so John Hughes is, is offensive. Number three, um, the word "fag" is used. So now he's already called somebody retarded. He's already called somebody fag. Hey, back in the day, people did use those words way more than they probably should have. And now I understand that they're um, definitely incorrect. Um, but as the film aged, you know, it gets, you know, they got worse and worse, you know, hearing shit like that. Um, although <laughs> when, when Sam, it's Samantha that says fag and it's the geek who's, you know, coming on strong and, you know, being, not taking no for an answer from her. He goes, can I ask you one question? And she goes, yes, you're a total fag. Which, as offensive as, you know, the F word is, uh, it was it was pretty funny at the time. I think dick would have worked, though. You know, if John Hughes was, you know, a little forward thinking, he could have said, she could have said, yes, you're a total dick. Would have been just as funny. You, know, you, don't have, you didn't have to do it, John Hughes. Although, you know, different time, I guess. Um, so Sam comes home and her grandparents have arrived. They're there for her older sister's wedding. Uh, her older sister is, you know, self-absorbed and vapid and whatnot. And her grandparents have showed up. They're taking over the house and, um, they're all good. All four of the grandparents in this film, the actors are like old Hollywood actors all character actors, and they're all fucking good. Um, there's a conserv more of a conservative set, and then there's more of a, you know, kind of fun-loving partying set. Uh, I don't know which one's the maternal and which one's the paternal one, but uh, the fun-loving ones are, you know, a little funnier. They play them for laughs a little bit more. And um, she gets sexualized by her own grandparents. In, in, a, in this in a scene you know both her both her grandfather and her grandmother um, you know sexualize her and talk about her 
development and whatnot, and her grandmother, you know, grabs her breasts, and her grandfather comments on them, and it's a little weird. <laughs> it's a little awkward and whatnot. Um, so she, to escape them, she runs into a bedroom, and then uh, she encounters an exchange student, and we come in up on John Hughes's offensive number four, Asian stereotypes. So we meet Long Duck Dong. It's always, you know, it was always funny to, you know, make fun of Asian people's names back in the day, and um, he, you know, every time that his name gets mentioned, a gong happens and whatnot, and uh, it's, uh, you know, clearly a little bit uh, stereotypical and slightly racist towards Asians. That said, Long Duck Dong is a funny ass fucking character. Uh, even if he, he, you kind of got to look at him as an outsider in a different world. And whether he was Asian or if he was a Nigerian or if he was a Russian or whatever, he would have just, he would have been as funny um, as if, you know, he was an Asian. So, but the actor who does him, Gede Watanabe, Watanabe, he really fucking nailed. If it wasn't, if Anthony Michael Hall hadn't done it, little, had a little bit more screen time and done, just acted a little bit better, then Gede would have done, would have been a Star Wars born. Although he didn't really go on to much. Although neither did Anthony Michael Hall. But the actor who plays Long Duck Dong really fucking nailed it. And really took it beyond just so it was an Asian stereotype, but he, 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 he rose above it. He made it work, you know, beyond that. And, uh, he's going to be back and forth. The guy fucking actually, you know, he parties a little bit <laughs> as, as we'll see. So, uh, the next scene, they go down into the kitchen and the interior design is, uh, an, an atrocity. Like the house, the makeup, and the design, and the wallpaper. Like nobody uses fucking wallpaper anymore. Uh, vinyl siding. Like there's all these fucking, in the 80s, there were all these ideas. And then like, like so many of them just fucking didn't work. And they were all just fucking terrible. Like wallpaper, and formica, and fucking shit like that. Anyways, Samantha's house is a, just a, uh, like an amalgamation of all of that shit. Um, also, uh, Mike is racist as fuck. Now, you can say that Long Duck Dong, the ratio, the racist uh, stereotypes of him, you know, you could go either way on that and be like, oh, whatever, well, our Asian people like that, blah, blah, blah. Mike says, this is undeniably racist, that they'll have to burn the sheets and mattresses after Long Duck Dong leaves. Now, that is unfucking disputable. That is fucking racist. Just because a gong plays, like maybe I could see somebody going, oh, I don't understand why. If you have to fucking burn shit because a person of another race touched it, then that's fucking blatantly fucking racist. But whatever, Mike's a dick. Um, they all have dinner. There's a little bit of a focus on Long Duck Dong during the dinner. Long Duck Dong gets invited by, you know, Long Duck Dong is a, uh, a guest of one of Samantha's grandparents, uh, the more conservative couple. And they think it would be great if he went to the dance. There's a high school dance that's happening uh, with Samantha. And uh, so Samantha, you know, being because she's insecure, she just goes along with it. So she has to bring this uh, Asian kid to the dance with her, and she's already awkward, and, you know, 
not feeling good about it. Her parents have forgot her birthday. Her whole family's forgot her birthday. And, um, but here she is. She's got to go to the fucking dance. She's got to bring this fucking Asian exchange student to a dance with her now. Um, so then we cut to the, to the dance. The dance is realistic. Um, more realistic than dances in other movies where, like, they would, sometimes in other movies they'd have a band at the fucking dance and I'd be like, the fuck kind of shit is this? Who has a band at, at, at a dance? Uh, the, 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 the dance is also in a gym, which is how I remember dances. Every now and then we would have one at, like, New World Landing or Country Club or something like that. But most of them were in gyms and shit, and there were bleachers. And the bleachers in this dance scene were exactly like the ones at my high school, Escambia. The tall pines that surround us. Um... They're those kind that kind of pull out or go back in or, or whatnot. And uh, it's clearly not a formal dance because everyone's just kind of, you know, wearing their pretty shitty clothes, 80s clothes and whatnot. Of course, true place. I know this much is true. I played it every day. Um... We see John Cusack. He shows up. He's one of Anthony Michael Hall's friends. Uh, pretty nerdy, geeky, I, I, presumably a freshman. Um, everybody's got a crush on somebody else at this dance. So uh, Jake's crushing on Samantha because he knows Eager Beats pretty and she's hot to trot. Um, Carolyn, Jake's girlfriend, still crushes on Jake. Um, Samantha crushes on Jake. And Anthony Michael Hall, the geek, crushes on Samantha. So there's a lot of like kind of scenes of like people uh, looking at each other and gazing at each other, which is kind of the way it was at dances. There were a lot of politics at play. That was that was realistic, you know. I mean, as a latchkey kid, um, the geek sees Samantha approaches her, and of course, because this motherfucker's got zero. You know, social skills. He comes on too strong and um, embarrasses himself. He hurts her feelings. He acts like a total dick. And But, you know, props to Anthony Michael Hall. He acts his ass off in these scenes. He's carrying some fucking weight. He's doing his fucking job. He's little. Because he would go on to be, you know, bigger and, and buffer. And, and he tried to shed that geek image, which he kind of had in a couple of these movies. Um, but, you know, he acts his ass off. Um, he shoots, you know, he blows it with her. He goes back and John Cusack and his partners and them are like, what the fuck, bruh? So, you know, because he's got a fragile male ego and whatnot, he tells them he's going to fuck Samantha by the end of the night. And he's going to... And they're like, all right, well, uh, they bet floppy disks on it. And these are those five-inch floppy disks. The real floppies. Not those ones that they call floppies that weren't floppy at all. The five-inch floppy disk, which I don't know how much memory they held, but not much. But apparently they were expensive because these guys are betting on them. And um, they ask, well, how are you going to have proof? You know, how are you going to prove? If you're going to fuck her, then, you know... And we're betting floppy disks on this motherfucker. And how are you going to prove it? And he goes, um, and they go, video. And Anthony Michael Hall, smartly, wisely, because this is an indicator of things that will come later. He doesn't want it, he says he doesn't want it dubbed a thousand times and ending up all over the place, which that shit fucking definitely happens. I don't know. It definitely fappens. It definitely fappens. I don't know if y'all remember the fappening. Sex tapes do get out, and you definitely don't want to have to fuck with that. So then they decide that it's um, going to be, it's necessary that he has to bring her underpants to her. That is as good as video evidence to John Kuzak and the boys. So, um, they, uh, you know, they, they set out to, to go do this stuff. There's a scene where Joan Kuzak 
is she, <laughs> this character, she's, not, she's only in, kind of in the background. She doesn't give a fuck about her headgear. Like, if I was wearing headgear, I wouldn't go to no fucking dance. I'm assuming that people didn't have to wear it all the fucking time, right? They had to wear it maybe eight hours a day or whatever. But if I was wearing headgear, I wouldn't go to no fucking dance, all right? Joan Cusack's character, she don't give a fuck about her headgear. She's going to the fucking dance. She's dancing. She's having a good fucking time with headgear on. More power to her, you know. So, Jake encounters Anthony Michael Hall, the geek plumber, Ted, and asks him about Samantha. And, and, and Anthony Michael Hall totally fucks Samantha over here. He says... She's my girl, man. Sorry. And in no way, shape, form, or fact, he completely cock blocks Jake and he completely cock blocks Samantha. So he is, a, you know, a, a total fucking selfish prick here because these two people are trying to hook up with each other. The sex is going to be amazing. And this little motherfucker is right in the middle of it, fucking everything up. So she totally blows it for, he totally blows it for Sam right then. Then he, you know, looks around like she's run off after he was a dick to her on the bleachers. And she, you know, runs off to the uh, driver's ed class or the shop class or whatever it is. He finds her there, you know, sits next to her and, you know, in this busted up car, you know. And uh, then he, you know, starts touching her, you know, without permission, she tells him to leave, he doesn't, um, uh, they, you know, the shop class is kind of, uh, it's abandoned, so, you know, if you're not trusting of Farmer Ted, you know, no one's gonna hear you scream in the shop class and shit like that, he's coming on too strong already, um, she, Days for whatever reason, it's unlikely she should bounce. Uh, then he apologizes, and then he starts to, you know, reveal, you know, that like, hey, I'm just, you know, I don't know what to fucking do to how to hit on women and whatnot. And he disarms her a little bit. Maybe it's her insecurity. Maybe it's her insecurity that allows her to kind of sit there and tolerate the geek. Um, I mean, she's pining for Jake, too. She's probably feeling a little, um, you know, useless uh, since that's not working out for her. Uh, then she tells the geek, Anthony and Michael Hall, that it's her birthday and that her family forgot. You know, maybe she just needs somebody to talk to or whatever. But um, that kind of leads to a bit of a bond between them. And she, you know, admits to him that, you know, you know, well, basically, you know, Sam, Samantha's depressed. You know, she's insecure and depressed. They often go, you know, hand in hand and whatnot. So she admits it to him and whatnot. And they kind of have a breakthrough, her and the geek, you know, even though he, I mean, he wasn't rapey, but he was towing the, you know, he was, you know, riding the edge of it. You know, he was kind of acting in a bit of a, an, an aggressive way with her earlier. Um, so he takes him a little bit more natural approach with her, starts talking to her, and, you know. And then once she starts to lighten up, he comes on too strong again. Fucking geek, you know. And then she pushes him off, and uh, it, you know, the geek is... It, what, what, I never came on too strong. I was always like, just like the women had to come on too strong for me, for me back in the day, you know, just for me to be like, I don't know. I think she wants to fuck me. She would have to like say, I want to fuck you. And then like almost grab me and pull me into a room and, you know, take my pants off back in the day. So the geek is the way opposite of what a young Lance Vargas was. Um, in fact, he asked her if he can fuck her, like in the in the you know the the shop class or the auto body mechanics class or whatever the fuck place that they're in. He asked her if she can fuck her. She straight up says she's saving herself for Jake, so she's thirsty. 
Samantha's thirsty for Jake. She wants to, uh, she, you know, through her insecurities, even though she's insecure, deep down, she's assertive and that she wants to fuck Jake. And she's willing and, and she's going to do what she has to do to, to fuck him. And even, and so she, she doesn't exactly say no to the Duke. Now, when he asked her if he can fuck her, she doesn't say no. She says, I'm saving myself for Jake. So maybe after Jake hits it, maybe the Duke can get in there. I don't know. That's 17 Candles. That's in the sequel or something like that. So, he, Jake, uh, the geek, Farmer Ted, tells her that Jake was asking about her earlier in the gym and it blows her Samantha's mind now so now she's like oh well maybe I fucking for whatever reason maybe I got a chance with this guy maybe my, my, my dream is gonna come true maybe I'm gonna get to fuck the senior and so she hurries up and, 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 and tries to get out of there and during this exchange, the geek explains to her that he bet floppy disks that he would fuck her and tells her that she doesn't have to actually fuck him. She just has to give him her underwear for like five minutes, um, which she inexplicably does, probably because, as we said, the title of the episode, she's insecure. So she feels as though she, you know, she doesn't have a say in the matter. So she gives the geek, Farmer Ted, Anthony Michael Hall, uh, her underwear. Yeah, it's pretty weird. Um, we cut to the back to the dance. We see Jake's girlfriend, Carolyn, my favorite character. Uh, she has pretty badass feathered hair as well. Not as good as Samantha's mom, but pretty fucking amazing. Like, this is about... I want to say this came out maybe seven years after Farrah Fawcett and all that, but still the feathered hair is uh, going strong. Um, Carolyn, Jake's girlfriend, and him are not getting along very well in the dance. Um, I guess their relationships just kind of run its course, you know. Um, they're 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 both not entirely into each other. She's kind of into him; he's less into her, but. That plays out a little bit later. Uh, also, during these scenes, be between the dance and the party, which is about to happen at Jake's house, the, the phrase, have a cow, is used, which is, uh, you know, a sign of the times. What did that fucking phrase even mean? What does it mean to have a cow? I know it means to freak out unnecessarily about something, but what does the phrase mean, to have a cow? Like, it, it's not an old phrase. It ain't from the 1800s. It ain't like the whole nine yards or, you know, uh, never the twain shall meet or anything like that. I mean, have a cow was a phrase that popped up in the 80s, ain't been back, and wasn't there before. So, question. What does it mean? Um... Sam decides that she's just going to come on strong to Jake. So she starts rehearsing herself uh, in the mirror. She's like going to come up to him and say, you know, she, she rehearses several lines and whatnot. But for someone so insecure, she's pretty sex positive. She's ready to fuck. And um, she... The and, and and Jake is ready to fuck her too. I mean, he 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 knows she wants to fuck, and he, you know he's he's ready to do it too. So I mean, it's it's just a matter of time. These two just gotta you know interface. We all know, like you know, in work situations or in partying situations, like when two people want to fuck, generally you know it would happen. Like once they decided, within ten to fourteen days, you know, it would it would happen. So. We all kind of know what's going to happen, but I guess during high school, you know, everything was just, everything was an event, you know. So, uh, she can't really, she never really gets a chance. She finally encounters Jake, and 
all the lines that she practiced because of her insecurity, uh, none of them come out, and then she just uh, walks away with a sad look on her face, and, and, and that's that for her. She's not getting laid tonight. Um, Samantha goes home and just disappears for the entire second act of the movie, which begins after the dance when we go to uh, Jake's uh, house, where he, He's throwing a party. His parents are out of town. And there's an after dance party. Long Duck Dong is there. Ladies and gentlemen. And Long Duck Dong is fucking partying. He's hooked up with a uh, athlete. A female athlete at the school. Who's uh, about, you know, six inches taller than him. Y'all know her. I'm down with that. And uh, they're getting fucked up together. They're drinking. They're smoking. They're eating a lot of fucking food. Fast food and shit. And, um, we, he, she calls him the dong. That, like, within two hours of him meeting her, she's already got a nickname for him, and the nickname is the dong. And he's smoking and drinking, and he's presumably fucking, you know, her in grandpa's car and shit like that, so... You know, the, the, the hero's journey of Long Duck Dong, the character arc of Long Duck Dong, is already fucking white hot. Like, he went from being Asian exchange student who didn't know a lot of English to at a party in high school, smoking, drinking, eating fast food, and fucking uh, a woman uh, five inches taller than him. Uh, a physical specimen, if you will. So, here... You know, his character ends up, uh, you know, is, is on a journey. And, and more on that later, of course. He drops Samantha off. Her night's done. Um, and even Samantha is, like, surprised that Long Duck Dong was able to, you know, become, you know, just, you know, inculcate himself into the high school scene so fucking fast. Um... And she describes herself as like a disease. She says, I'm like a disease. Because, you know, the title of the episode is Samantha is insecure. So she goes home. She has to sleep on Sofa City, which is what her little brother Mike calls the couch at their house because everyone's sleeping in her bed and shit. Grandparents are sleeping in her bed and shit. Um, but other characters' nights have just begun. As we go into the second act, um, there's a dance party. There's two 80, 80, they, we show, we see Jake's house, and there's two 80s mobiles parked out front. There's a 1970 Camaro and a pretty sweet, maybe early 80s Mustang 5.0. And 5.0s are fast, man. The cops use those in my hometown. And they were, they, they were, they were good shit, shit now. Jake isn't having a good time at his party, though. Uh, Carolyn definitely is. His girlfriend, she's partying. She's getting fucking wasted. Uh, remember that. Remember that Carolyn gets wasted. Joan Cusack is there with her headgear on. Not only did she go to the dance, not only did she leave the house with her headgear on, she went to a dance, and then she went to the party after the fucking dance. That's fucking cool. She don't give a fuck about her headgear. I, you know... I, I just would be a little bit more insecure about it, you know? But, um, Long Duck Dong shows up, pow, wrecks fucking grandpa's car. He don't give a fuck. He's having the full-on 80s high school experience because in the 80s, this is not, this is a little bit of a difference between the decades, between the 80s and the 90s. More, 80s were more like the 70s in which you just fucking partied in high school. All the fucking time. That's all there was to do. You weren't listening to fucking good music and shit like that. Because there wasn't any good fucking music in the 80s. You just fucking partied and fucked. And that's what Long Duck Dong was doing. He's partying and he's fucking. And um, that's why his character is, uh, is certainly something special here. Uh, I, and, and all these parties that, that, that I saw in these movies. The little latchkey kid, me. I wasn't going to them at this point. I thought that this is what parties were. Like, that you just got completely fucked up and trashed the house and acted as ludicrous and stupid as possible. 
And some some were like that. <laughs> some were like that. Some high school parties were like that. Um. Anyways, Jake is not having a good time at his party. He's fat. This dude is so fucking thirsty. He's so fucking thirsty. He's at his own party. He's up in his room. And he is, oh my god. And I know, guys, let's all just admit this. He is gazing at Samantha's picture in the yearbook. And I've done it. I've done it. And guys, admit that you have done it too. Um, when, you're, when, you're, when you're that thirsty, you just, uh, I, I, you know, enough said, enough said. Uh, we've all been that Jake Ryan type thirsty and stared at the yearbook picture. Uh, the Geek. Anthony Michael Hall, Farmer Ted, he decides he's hitting this fucking party. And um, him and his partners, John Cusack and them, are a little bit nervous about it because they know they're freshmen and they're nerds and they can't even... The, the cast system at this high school is so intense that you can't even fucking show up at a party. You can't even show your face at a party if you know, you're a freshman and nerdy. They decide they're going to do it Maybe uh, Farmer Ted, the geek Anthony Michael Hall feels empowered by, you know, the underpants that he showed, you know, all his partners earlier and whatnot. He's holding a, a chick's underpants in his pocket. He even says that, like, hey, if anyone fucks with us, I got a girl's underpants in my pocket. And that this, <laughs> having a woman's underpants, a 16-year-old girl's underpants, who just turned 16, I might add, is somehow like this badge that he can just pull out and wield at people and that they'll treat him as cool. Uh, anyways, he knocks on the door. Fucking Long Duck Dong is working the door. Long Duck Dong is cooler than these fucking dudes and he's only been in America like a few months. He's only been in this fucking, he knows nobody at this party. That doesn't fucking matter to him. He's working the fucking door at this party, man. He's really acclimating. So Jake's thirst for Samantha gets so so bad. He somehow ended up with her phone number. I think that was established earlier. But he calls her. She's got a private line, uh, which you know kids kids used to have back in the day because we would spend, you know, we didn't have Facebook and Twitter and or cell phones or anything. So we would spend sometimes five, six, seven, eight hours on the phone with each other. No joke. Uh, so sometimes you know. Private lines were got. Also, our, our friends would call us like later at night after our parents had gone to sleep and shit. So Jake calls her private line and ends up talking to her grandparents and he's fucking the combo up and he offends them and so on. And, uh, he tells them to, he, he, he doesn't endear himself to the, the grandparents whatsoever. Um, back at the party, Long Duck Dong and his girlfriend start working out. That's, <laughs> that's, how, uh, that's how amazing this woman Long Duck Dong has picked up is. That she'll just like, in the middle of a party say, yo, I gotta stop, stop, I gotta go work out. And he, there's a great scene. <laughs> There's a great <laughs> scene of him. She's on her exercise cycle. So she's like outweighs him by like probably, you know, 20 or 30 pounds and is taller than him about six inches and whatnot. And she's on an exercise bike and she's pedaling and he is uh, like sitting on her lap cowgirl style and she's just fucking going at it, you know, going up and down on the exercise bike and he's just gazing into her eyes like he, you know, like deeply in love with her. It's a great fucking scene. Long Duck Dong, man, he's a, he's definitely um, the hero with a thousand faces in this shit. It's kind of hot. It's kind of hot when he cowgirls are like that, man. Um, so the party kind of trickles down. Caroling uh, is trying to get Jake's attention. Uh, he doesn't want none. He slams the door um, in her face. She gets her hair caught in the door. Her hair gets chopped off by a uh, 
by a couple of her partners. One of her partners was, um, I forgot, the Jamie Gertz, who ended up in Lost Boys and probably uh, and Less Than Zero and whatnot. She, she kind of shows up for a brief moment in this. Um, Jake's house is trashed. There's a tape deck, which is all fucked up. There's a turntable that's all fucked up. Their HVAC system, which is, I think was one of those ones that were, where, you know, it might have been one of those ones where it was in the wall, but it's all fucked up. Um, and Jake's just kind of looking at it, and uh, he sees that Anthony Michael Hall has been trapped in the coffee table. Like somebody like placed, uh, I don't know if Anthony Michael Hall couldn't get out or whatnot, but the geek farmer Ted and them um, is uh, trapped in there. So he frees them. Then we cut to a scene where Samantha's on her couch. She can't get to sleep. Her daddy comes down, character actor Paul Dooley, wakes her up and confesses. He knows now that they fucked up and they forgot her birthday. And uh, she feels like a... Um, he tells him, he tells her she that he feels like a dork, gives her a little pep talk, raises Samantha's self-esteem, which I suppose, you know, maybe girls at that age, you know, need their daddies to coach them up a little bit. And, um, but, you know, actually, we don't know where Samantha's insecurities came from. Maybe they came from this fucker. You know, she, we, we come into the movie knowing Samantha's insecure. We don't know why. You know, and it, it could easily have been her daddy. We don't know. But um, he tries to coach her up a little bit, and it seems to work. There's a nice little scene of them on the couch and whatnot. Um, <laughs> there's a cheesy ass line where he goes, where Sam says that her crush on Jake. Uh, hurts and her daddy says that's why they call them crushes they're supposed to hurt or something like that totally fucking stupid <laughs> anyways back at Jake's house uh, Jake and the geek are hitting it off they're becoming friends and this is kind of these scenes we already kind of know that Anthony Michael Hall farmer Ted the geek is a horrible person and we're starting to suspect that Jake is also a tr garbage human and uh, the in the in the next series of scenes we kind of you know that gets further revealed so maybe it's an alpha male thing I don't know but Anthony Michael Hall starts lecturing Jake on women he's making a martini uh, he's acting his ass off like Anthony Michael Hall acts his ass off throughout this whole scene, so bravo to him. Um, he gives him Samantha's underwear. Anthony Michael Hall gives Jake Samantha's underwear as if it's like a commodity or whatever. Um, he demeans, Anthony Michael Hall demeans women. He's obviously got issues with women or girls or whatever. I mean, he's a freshman, he's probably 14 or whatever. But he accuses them of constantly playing manipulative mind games and using sex to uh, control them and whatnot. Um, clearly, we're kind of getting, you know, we're establishing that, you know, there's going to be a, that, that Anthony Michael Hall is going to grow up to be some sort of, you know, toxic, you know, masculine motherfucker. And Jake, Jake too. I know Jake is held in high regard in some circles as being like, you know, a beautiful crush and everything, but the guy's a piece of shit. And we're going to find that out here in a second. Um, Anthony Michael Hall kind of goes through the motions and tells Jake he better not be using her just for sex or he would get somebody to, uh, you know, kick his ass. Um, and then we lead into Aunt, uh, John Hughes's offensive Lance's list, John Hughes's offensive number four. Um, Jake says he could go upstairs because Carol and his girlfriend is asleep upstairs. He could go upstairs and basically rape her. He, he uses the phrase violate her in 10 different ways, but he basically means, um, you know, I'm going to go up there and I could go up there and have sex with her passed out body and whatnot. 
So what does the geek fucking say? He says, what are you waiting for? Go on up there and rape your girlfriend, bruh. Go ahead up there and have unconsented, non-consensual sex with your passed out girlfriend. What a fucking piece of shit. What a garbage human, right? Um, so Carolyn, the girlfriend, she's the most mistreated person in the entire fucking movie. She is cast aside and demeaned by Jake, and uh, her friends cut her hair off in that previous scene. She's treated like an object by both Jake and the geek, Farmer Ted, Anthony Michael Hall. All the while, basically, everyone says, and she seems to behave in such a way, that she's a really sweet, reasonably tempered, smart woman. You know, she's the... She's the most like mistreated person uh, character in this whole movie. Um, Jake says she doesn't know anything about love, and then he trades her. He trades her to the geek for a pair of Samantha's underpants. Now, can we like even just take a moment and like think about how fucked up these two men are? These two guys are. One guy traded an entire person for another woman's underpants. And what's he going to do with them? Like, smell them and jerk off? I don't know where I got that idea. Anyways, um, as sexist as the whole scene is, Jake ends up with Samantha's underpants. The geek ends up with Carolyn, who's passed out too drunk to make any of the right decisions. And Jake puts the geek, Farmer Ted, Anthony Michael Hall, into his daddy's Rolls Royce and just lets him go off knowing that he's going to rape her or with a reasonable suspicion that he's going to rape her and Jake could give a fuck this is his fucking girlfriend you know this is somebody who you know we're, we're, we're meant to assume that there is a a, a, a bond between these two but um Apparently not, because he's just like, uh, here, take her in my daddy's car. First of all, he's fucking his dad over. You know, I know his dad's probably a rich asshole, but Jake's still a terrible son for letting a, a, a you know, 14 or 15 year old kid run off. Like, he's fucking his dad. We don't really, I, I don't think I need to really expound on what a piece of shit Jake is for, for doing all this shit. Uh, nor what a piece of shit Anthony Michael Hall Farmer Ted the Geek is. Uh, and those two together are um, the two worst people in the movie. Um, uh, the the Geek is a better is the better of the two. He doesn't really want to take the car, but Jake kind of pressures him to peer pressures him to. So whatever. Um, so they leave. Uh, Jake has an encounter with Long Duck Dong. Uh, Long Duck Dong is completely fucked up by this point. He's lost his girl. He doesn't know where the fuck she's at. Um, but Jake, being the huge fucking, uh, you know, sociopath, basically, that he is, he beats up Long Duck Dong. The most likable fucking character in the movie, Jake beats his ass up. Pretty savagely, I might add, too. More evidence that Jake is a monster. Um, the geek and Farmer Ted, Anthony Michael Hall, they go on. They're partying pretty hard. She seems fun. You know, I got a soft spot in my heart for Carolyn. She seems fun. She's partying. She's, you know, they, 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 he takes her over to his papa's house and tries and fails to get a picture of his, uh, of him and the Rolls Royce with the prom queen, which Carolyn is, and that fails. But he he wants his conquest. He's feeling as though he you know he's a big you know he's his ego is full and he's like you know I got the prom queen and a Rolls Royce. I want to take it over. I want to show my partners how how better than them I am. And I want a picture taken of it. Although the you know the you know divine intervention is that the picture doesn't uh, work out for him. So we fade until the next morning, third act. Um, we opened a long duck dong being passed the fuck out in front of the house. Um, 
He's still fucking partying. He's still probably a little bit drunk. A dog awakes him by licking his face. Um, they, they, everyone's wondering where he's at. And someone asks if he's retarded, so the R word is used again. Um, Samantha's having a little bit better of a morning. Her mom apologizes to her about the birthday, uh, but it's all ruined uh, because once she starts feeling good about herself again, everyone starts kind of like apologizing for the birthday forgetting the birthday the geeks betrayal is fully revealed because she calls randy samantha calls randy and her friend she tells her over the phone that her randy's little brother paid a dollar to see her underwear and samantha's trust is in the geek has been violated because he took the underwear and you know made money off people looking at it and shit like that it's gross kind of but i guess you know shit like that happens in high school and um, so the, the Samantha's older sister's wedding proceeds as, um, as planned. It, you know, we, we, we go deeper into the final act. And um, as they're leaving to go to the wedding, they find Long Duck Dong on the front lawn. And it's a really funny scene. I can't really add anything to it. It's well acted. I mean, get a Watanabe, one Tanabe is pretty good. Uh, but he, the one thing about that scene is when he's on the, you know, front lawn is that he rebukes Grandpa with old white man ways, and um, you know that's that's where the Donger's character are kind of you know, comes to its close, you know, it's when he just rejects grandpa. He's like, yo, man, I've been fucking, you, you brought me here as an exchange student, but it's hinted at earlier in the film that he's been doing, he's been making man, long duck dong do manual labor and whatnot. And he's like, yo, man, fuck you, bro, man. You worked my ass to death, man. I stole your car. I went out and had a good old fucking time. So <laughs> that's where, that's where Long Duck Dong's character, that's where he rejects the white man and his patriarchal bullshit. He says, man, fuck you. Your car's in a lake. Big lake, bruh. Fuck off, man. I went and I partied, I smoked, and I fucking got laid. You suck, Grandpa. Anyways, um, good scene for Long Duck Dong there. Um... Grandma calls him a scuzzbag, though. You know she thought that the whole fucking time. And she batters him a little bit. She, like, punches him or kicks him or something. Fucking grandma and grandpa. Um, we cut to Carolyn and Ted. They uh, Farmer Ted, Anthony Michael Hall, the geek. They wake up in the parking lot of the church uh, by where Sam's sister is getting married. Um... It's a rather unique morning after scene. They kind of put the pieces back together of what the night was before. Carolyn's unsure of who he even is. Uh, they come to the conclusion that they did indeed, you know, fuck. And they did both indeed enjoy it. So I guess that's consensual. Uh, she enjoyed most was waking up in the geek's arms. Hmm. Uh, which kind of, you know suggests that she was pretty emo that Jake was not super emotionally available to her you know if if she can wake up in a stranger's arms and, 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 and like it then she probably wasn't getting a lot of physical affection from Jake you know and um, it sort of also disproves what Jake was saying about her in it in it you know in Carolyn's defense because I'm a I stand Carolyn I stand Carolyn in this movie he did say that she was emotionless in an earlier scene, and I don't know. She doesn't seem that way. Like it seems like maybe he's projecting that onto her, you know. Um, she she sees him. He pulls up at the church because he's looking for Samantha. She sees him. They have a little. They break up basically, and um, they sort of, you know they sort of mutually agree. Jacob. I do want to say this about Jake. Um, 
he drives a Porsche 944, a red Porsche 944. I'm going to say this, and I mean it. No, way, no man who drives a Porsche is a nice guy. They're all dicks. It's 100%. Not a single Porsche driving man is worth a goddamn thing. They're, they all suck. They're all assholes. They're all pricks. They're all douchebags. No arguments. So, uh, Jake, also in the background of that scene where Jake and Carolyn meet up a little bit, um, there's two fantastic 80s mobiles. There's an 81 rabbit. It's not green like Tiffany Bursts back in the day, who used to, you know, by the time I, they didn't have buses for summer school, so you had to get there one way or the next, and Tiffany Burst uh, was nice enough to bring me and Brad Sowers to summer school in uh, a Volkswagen Rabbit. Uh, that was green. Uh, this one is not green, but it is in the background of that scene. And there's also a 1980 Honda Accord sedan, which is green. And uh, I did have a girlfriend that had that pretty much that same car. That's kind of the joy of watching these movies is that you can see like shit that is nostalgic and real nostalgic. Like some some director from 2012 or whatever didn't say we need an 81 Green Rabbit. Um, it's an actual 81 Green Rabbit, you know. So that's that's a real beautiful thing about these films. Uh, we'll cut. There's the wedding is happening. We'll cut to that. Uh, Samantha's older sister is getting married and uh, I'll sort of breeze through it because it doesn't have a lot to do with you know the plot of the movie um, she gets hopped up on muscle relaxers because of menstrual cramps and does a bit of the, the actress who plays her sister does a really good job doing some physical comedy uh, during the wedding scene uh, Zelda Rubenstein the little uh, short lady from Poltergeist she shows up and you know has a couple lines She's great, and you know, of course we love her. Brian Doyle Murray, Bill Murray's brother, and great character actor of the 80s. He shows up. He's good as shit. Uh, they get hitched. Everyone's up outside the church, and they're sending them off. And I'm sure it was a fun scene to shoot. The whole, you know, most of the cast was there, and they're throwing rice and stuff like that. And then there's this iconic scene where finally, our you know two crushes Samantha and Jake interface. She goes back for her sister's you know veil that she forgot, and everyone is left without her because no one gives a fuck about Samantha, and that's what makes her insecure. By the time she comes back out of her chair, out of the church when she went to get the veil, everybody's gone, and nobody said like, uh, "What about Samantha?" But as they're pulling away, they reveal. And it's, I'm sure this scene has touched the hearts of all the girls I grew up with. As the cars are pulling away from the church, there's Jake waiting for Samantha besides his, beside his 80s mobile, an 83 Porsche 944. And he kind of beckons to her. And she, insecure to the very end, you know, he must, she, she looks behind her because she must think that he's referring to somebody else. And then realizes it's her and she goes to him and a nice little Thompson twin song plays pleasantly and they exchange a few little sweet words and uh, she finally decides you know she's like are you going to the reception and she she says yeah and he's like oh okay and then she and then she's finally you know and this is where her where, where her character finally breaks through and she does something you know you know, for her. She says, fuck the reception. I'm tired of this shit. I'm going to go fuck Jake Ryan. So she says, I'm done. So he goes, all right, come on, let's go fuck. So um, he does her right. He gets her a little uh, birthday cake with 16 candles, even though it's the, the, the day after her birthday. And they have a really awkward kiss sitting on top of a table with the candles burning right underneath them as they kind of lean over it and kiss. But whatever. Uh, I presume they fucked after that. And hopefully 
all night long like a Lionel Richie song. You know what I'm saying? The credits roll. And that that is that. That is that for 16 Candles. Um, and, you know, all the characters did go through something. You know, for, 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 for a film with a meandering plot like it did, all the characters did eventually arrive at a different place than where they first arrived. So that was good. Oh, and now we come to where are the characters now? Now, it's not like where the actors are now. Where are the characters now? What became of these people? Um, we'll start with Jake and Samantha. Uh, Jake and, well, they fucked that night, we know. They fucked like crashing cars that night. And uh, for several months after. It takes, a, it takes a while for them to get it out of their system. You know, they're just, they're just constantly fucking. Uh, Samantha's social status is elevated, and Jake is kind of seen as more of a thoughtful person around school. Uh, he and they break up. The relationship runs its course. He uses his status as a sensitive man um, to kind of fuck a lot of girls in the high school, and uh, he calls them sleepers. They're like, you know, girls who aren't popular but are hot or that he finds attractive or whatever. So he runs through like some band girls and some drama girls and you know some uh, smart girls and whatnot, you know because uh, he he he's into that now. Um, underclass girls, willing girls, uh, girls with hot bodies who he can have short flings with and then break up with, you know. And after high school, he gets himself a little business degree, and he's a sales rep for Motorola now in the greater Chicago area. Jake Ryan, kind of peaked in high school. Uh, Samantha, emboldened by her relationship with Jake and her daddy's speech that night, which she never forgot, and she always pursues the man she wants from then forward. So now she's like going, when I want him, when I see a man that I want, I'm going for it. I'm never going to be insecure again. She's the, always the more forward person and all the flirtation, and as a result, she tends to find shy and good-looking guys, but without a lot of motivation. And then she dates a few of those for a few years and finally chooses one, like around mid-20s. She starts a family with, and she's the primary motivation in her family, and both her husband and her children end up solely motivated in their lives by her hen-pecking them all the time, fucking with them, blah, 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 blah. And later in life, uh, you know, some anxiety and depression, but always a forward thinker. Her family, she gets a family of four and is very successful. And through the miracle of pharmaceuticals, succeeds more than Mike, uh, Jenny, uh, her little sister, or her older sister. Uh, all of her family, she's the most successful one. Just by always, you know, continuing to push through for what she wants. Jake Ryan did that for her. The geek, Farmer Ted, Anthony Michael Hall, he plunges headlong into womanizing and after idolizing Jake, eventually he grows into his body, you know, because he's kind of fucking thin and nerdy in the film. He grows into his body and his frame and becomes somewhat athletic and then he starts bullying and he, you know, bullying traits emerge more and more and he tries to kill the geek persona that existed inside. He's like, I'm not a geek. I'm not a nerd. I'm a big, strong man. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, after high school, he uses his, you know, a little bit more popular and, you know, headstrong social status. Uh, and he's got, you know, he's a smart guy. He's got a decent head in his shoulders. So he goes into college. He joins a fraternity. And his life is forever altered, though. When a pledge dies at his fraternity from alcohol poisoning during hazing week. He does a little bit of time for that. He becomes a regional sales rep in the greater Chicago area for Caterpillar. You know, he sells tractors, tractor parts, shit like that. After he you know, gets out of prison for that hazing job. Anyways, that's 16 Candles. And that's going to close out John Hughes for me. I'm going to do 10 of these. and But I definitely wanted to, you know, I came heavy with John Hughes at the beginning because I you know I really felt he was that important to us growing up and whatnot um, but we're gonna switch gears 
here for the next one. And we're going to do something, a, a film I've been looking forward to for quite a while. Conan the Barbarian. The childhood trauma of Conan in Conan the Barbarian. So this one's going to be great because we get to talk about, you know, Arnold's first um, real big time movie. And a, a, a film that to me I knew was adult as fuck. Like I saw it as a I don't know seven year old but I knew I was watching something that was not meant for me that I was watching an adult film it had sex it had violence it was you know old English it was from another world and shit like that it had fucking this big ass dude named with a crazy fucking name in it and it was violent Nudity and blood. And um, I watched it again recently, and we're going to review it. And come to find out, it's got a pretty good story. Conan, uh, Conan had some childhood trauma. And through the events of the film, he deals with it in his own special way. So up next, the childhood trauma of Conan the Barbarian. Thanks, y'all.